All right, in that case, I'm going to start. Welcome to the August meeting of the Western Pennsylvania Mushroom Club. Since our last meeting, a lot has happened. We spent the entire month of July playing summer mushroom bingo on iNaturalist. And it got very competitive. The bingo chart was created by our identifier, Kara Coulter. And we ended up with a lot of winners. The first person to get a bingo was Carson Gross. And he ended up with two bingos. Second person was Garrett Taylor, who got five bingos. And third was Dirk Capo with three bingos. And we also had honorable mention for three people who got one bingo. And that was Carissa Mendez, Silas Claypool, and Kara Coulter. And so they have all received or will soon be receiving their prizes. And we're hoping to have a fall mushroom bingo too. Okay, our recent walks were with Allegheny Land Trust. On July 25th, we had one at Lynbrook, Lynbrook Woodlands with Kara Coulter. And you can see everybody in the picture there is wearing a mask. And then last weekend, we did Devil's Hollow with Fluff Burger. Okay, we have an event coming up next week that we are co-sponsoring the C.C. Malore Memorial Library. And so I have the link up top there. You'll have to type in ccmalorelibrary.eventbrite.com. It is free. And our identifier, Stephen Buckland, will be presenting Foraging for Fungi in Your Backyard. It's Wednesday, August 26th at 6 p.m. Okay, other things that are coming up, September 5th will be a secret walk in Westmoreland County, led by Richard Jacob. Friday, September 11th will be secret walks in Clarion County. And Saturday morning, September 12th will be secret walks in North Park. Now for all of those, you need to register because we're limiting attendance. So just go to our website, wpamushroomclub.org, go to events and find the event you want to attend. And if you just scroll down, you'll see the registration form. And if you get selected, then 24 hours before the walk, you'll be told exactly where to meet. And then on Saturday afternoon, September 12th, we're doing a live stream interview with Wong Lit Woon. Now she wrote the book, The Way Through the Woods. And what we're planning is for me to interview her one o'clock our time, Saturday, September 12th. It'll be on the same channel. Now it, it'll be interesting because she's in Norway. So it's gonna be 7 p.m. her time, but it should be fun, especially if we work all these kinks out. There will be a review of this book in the next newsletter, which should be out by the end of the month. Okay. The club has a new identifier, Dirk Capo. He submitted a list of 200 known mushrooms. It was reviewed and approved, and then the board approved of making him an identifier. Then we gave out some more buttons. We gave a 10 button to Dean Gross, who is in this picture. Now look at his wallpaper. He's got mushroom wallpaper. We also gave a 75 button to Cherie and a 100 button to Julie Travaglini. Okay, here's our membership report. As of Saturday, we had 790 members from 442 households. And I am pleased to announce that all 2020 members will automatically be renewed through 2021 at no cost. And that's to show our appreciation for sticking with us through this strange year. Okay, next month's meeting, September 15, is gonna be Leon Chernoff. He's the editor of Mushroom, the Journal of Wild Mushrooming. He's gonna talk about fall mushrooms. And tonight's speaker is our Bolite Specialist, Scott Pavel. So at this point, I'm going to, I'm done. So I'm gonna let the other guys do their thing. Okay, let me see if I can't find how to do this. All right, so thank you, Cecily. So Cecily, you can 
exit out of this Zoom meeting. I will. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. And um, Scott, um, you need to find your pictures so sure. we can see your pictures on the screen. I am screen sharing. Am I there? Yes, you are there. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, about three years ago at a foray, Bully Bill Yule was here, maybe five years ago. I don't know. I'm getting old and forgetful. Bill gave a talk on what he called tells, the, the tricks for identifying bullies. And five years later, I think I finally understand what he meant. And it basically comes down to this. Other mushrooms are illiterate. They don't read the books and they don't obey. Bullies are completely literate. They read the books. They just have a wicked sense of humor and they like mocking us. So the best trick to learning bullies is not to say they're hard and not to say they're easy. It's to realize that they have little giveaways. They have tells like a poker player will. And you have to just learn the easy ones and then build on up. The mushroom on the screen right here is probably the easiest and most famous of them all. There's nothing else that looks like this. This is uh, Frosty Eye, now in Buteri Boletus, a butter bully. Uh, used to be in Exudosporus. Before that, it was Boletus. They're all shifting like crazy. You can learn this one simply and easily, and you're done. Now, sometimes it'll hide. It gets old, and you'll see that that uh, that distinctive stem uh, will disappear. Um, you have to look down at the bottom. Sometimes they have more yellow, sometimes more red. But just learn it. It's that easy. It's like when you have a kid in your class, you're the teacher, and the kid has you know brilliant red hair. It's not that hard to remember. The next one, the old man of the woods, which I only have this tiny picture of. That's just as distinctive. There's two of them. Nobody can tell them apart without a microscope. Um, it's shaggy black or white or white and black on top, stains red underneath. The third one, I'm going to show you two photos. This one you're going to see a lot around here. And if you ever have a taste of it, you'll remember it. This is Plumbio violations, Hylopolis Plumbio violations. The plum is your clue. That brilliant, beautiful purple. This is one of the bitter bolides. Uh, when you find a big, robust, charismatic bully from Southwest PA, it's always a good idea to do a nibble test. Just take a small piece, chew on it for 10, 20, 30 seconds, and you'll find out. If it's bitter, oh, it's bitter. You'll, you will experience it, you'll curse my name, but you'll never forget it. Um, there is apparently a small percentage of people, like 15%, who just don't taste that bitter. I've never met one. I don't taste it profoundly, but I taste these. Uh, it does tend to intensify when it gets cooked. Uh, these are actually not toxic. I should make that point. The bitter bullets just taste bad. One big one will ruin an entire pot roast. They're that powerful. But the thing about them is if you were starving, if you were a pioneer, you could eat these and they're healthy. If you don't taste the bitterness, they're perfectly healthy. I have a friend down in, I think he's in South Carolina, internet friend, who makes culinary bitters out of these, which are delicious. Uh, he sent me a little bottle and I have used them, almost used them up. Uh, so that's a third one, super easy to identify and you can go through it. Here's a fourth one, just as easy. This is the ash bully. Well, let Nellis marry you, Leoides. Uh, look at the pores. I mean, if you see pores like that, there's only one thing it can be. Richard, Richard Jacob found this, I guess, two weeks ago. Now, there's all sorts of funny little information about this. You only find it under ash tree, but it's not actually associated with the ash. This is feeding off of the, uh, what, what's left by an aphid that is parasitic on ash tree. Really cool, really cute. But the point is, if you look at this, 
and you remember it, you will find it. It's easy. There's only one of them. Simple. That's four that anybody can know. Here's one. And you all have found this if you've done any foraging around the Pittsburgh area. Here's another picture that John Plisky took. Same mushroom. Sometimes it grows in clumps. Brilliant sun-like yellow on it. It's an Oreo boletus. And it also has a tell. You can't tell it from the picture. This is Inixus. And everybody who's found it and knows it is nodding and laughing right now. This one stinks. Not bad. It, it's just sort of like a, I don't know, a, a strange mushroom smell that climbs into your sinuses and rattles around screaming at you. Uh, dries out. It's perfectly edible. It's kind of tasty when it's dry. Uh, I can never pick them because Kate gets a vicious headache from just being in the car with them. Uh, another thing about this mushroom, that brilliant sun yellow, this is a, a characteristic of the genus, Oreo boletus, Oreo like in sun. If you see a yellow that bright in a mushroom that's not that big, look these up. I think there's only five of them. It's pretty straightforward. Other ones that are hard, unless you know what the tell is. I hope everybody's nodding at this one, unless you're new. This is uh, Boletus pallidus, which about a month ago changed its name to Imleria pallida. This has a really simple, tell. it's a very plain, pallid, buff colored bolete with light yellow pores. But you see that distinctive greenish gray bruising on the pores, it's distinctive. There's nothing else that does that. So when you find one and it's buff like this, you scratch the pores. That's one of the standard things you do with a bullet. Hey, presto, it turns that color, it's palina. Super simple. Here's another one that people seem to think is complicated, but it's enormously com uh, common locally. You'll find it everywhere. It's all but impossible to key out. This one has, it read the, the Bessette Rudy keys and it, it decided it would be clever and laugh at everybody. Um, this is Lexanellum albellum. There's nothing else that really looks like it except on paper. It has the little scabers, see the, the rough marks going up and down? Those are called scabers, raised um, dots or blotches. That, when you see that, you think Lex something, Lexinum, Lexanella. This one's different because if you look at those tubes, they're really deep. It's almost balloony in there. There's very little flesh. And it's a long, skinny stem. Grows under oaks, grows everywhere around Pittsburgh. If you see a long, skinny black and white like this, your odds are about 80% it's Lexanella malbellum. Now, if it's another one, there are a couple of Lexinums that look like this. All the mycologists need to turn off their, their sound now. This is only for the normal pot hunters like me. If you see one and it's not Lexanella malbellum, but it looks like this, you don't care. You really don't. All the Lexinums that look like this are even better edibles than this one. This one, the stem can be kind of stringy and sometimes you need to chop it off. Those are just flat out good. Okay, sound on again for the mycology types. Next one up. This one drives people crazy from the outside. Look at the top left. It's brown on brown. It's enormously plain. It's not that big. It's got, you know, white pores. Look at the stipe, the stem. Those hollows are not from buds. This is gyroporus, or I think that's how you pronounce it, Castaneus. I learned a couple of weeks ago that its name has also changed. I don't know the new name yet. This one, when you see a brown on brown like this, a small brown on brown mushroom, squeeze it. Just squeeze that stem. And it will feel like it's hollow because it is. 
That's a dead giveaway. There are some other gyropters. There's one that turns brilliant blue when you cut it open. They're all edible. They're uh, a gift for the mycology type. Apparently, they are one of the ancestral bolides. They're much older than Neobolides, Boletus, and the rest of them. But that's their tell, the hollow stem. Now, sometimes if you squeeze a bolid, it'll be hollow. You cut it open, and all you'll see are, is giant bug lines going up. It got eaten by larvae. This is different. Again, look, you see those hollows? Somebody, a friend of mine down in Florida, told me it's because internally they grow in a spiral. So when you cut it, you're actually seeing the gaps in the spiral. I don't know if it's true, but it looks like it for sure. Here's another of the most typical ones. And if you ever want to prank a friend, this is what you use. Walt Sturgeon pranked me on this one. This is Pseudobolitis parasiticus. See the poison pigskin puffball, the scleroderma? This bully grows only as a parasite on the, the poison pigskin puffball. I'm here to tell you, there it is again. Uh, wrong one. It's all but impossible to identify. It, this is just generic brown nothing, unless you find it with the hose. So that's the prank. You pull it off its puffball, you hand it to somebody who knows what they're doing, and you say, what's this one? All innocent and sweet. You have to be innocent and sweet. Can you identify this? And they'll go through <laughs> the tortures of the dam because there's nothing at all distinctive about the darn thing, except it grows connected to a puffball. And there's nothing else in the world that does that. Here's a subtle one, another good one to find. This is delicious. This is Redibolitis griseus. Now that, that genus, Redibolitis, has a couple of different mushrooms. The big genus tag is, uh, if you look down, you see the, the really wide netting all over the stipe. This would be hard to identify for anybody that way, except at the, for what you see down at the bottom. See that bright, bright yellow? Here's another one that I found locally. This was a baby. You see the netting in the center there. Right at the bottom, a bug was starting to come up, and the flesh reacted by turning this brilliant yellow. That's the tell. You cut, you know, the bolates, you have the whole spectrum of different things that you'll use. This one turns yellow at the bug holes. Yellow down here where it's damaged at the bottom. That's your tell. That's 10 bolates we just went through. Bing, bang, boom that fast. All of them are pretty darn easy to find. Now, that leads to a corollary, and I'm going to see if I can't shift over here to the bully filter. working on it. Sorry, everybody, I'm having a hassle with my computer now. Let me get back up here. And... Can you share? There it is. Share. This should have popped up now. Okay. Kate, if this isn't the uh, the bully filter that people are seeing, come and let me know. What we just did, we went down 10 mushrooms looking for their distinctive tells, the thing that's weird about them. That is the best way to use our bully filter. Look for the weird. It's pretty simple. If you go through any of the uh, the regular paper um, dichotomous keys, 
they'll start you on the stem features. You have to have to. That's where you start for uh, for the weird mushrooms, uh, for the ones that are in the middle and hard to find. What this does, what the synoptic key does, is allow us to look for whatever strange feature happens to be there. Right now, we're looking at southwestern Pennsylvania. Um, so I'm going to pull up the strange feature. How about scaly or spiky? If I have a scaly or spiky cap, it should, in fact, it has to be one of these. None of, none of the other ones uh, could qualify. You may have one like some of those spray, yeah, which you find up at uh, Cook's Forest all the time. It'll crack like crazy. But if you have something that's really drastically cracked, it's going to be one of these. We go over wrinkled, pitted or corrugated, one of my favorites. These are the caps you find that are just nutty, wrinkled. Let's look down and find a particular one. There's air. Mexinellum crossopodium. There are three mushrooms that can get really, in, in our area, that can get really crazy wrinkled like this. See how bumpy that is? Crossopodium, which old timers will remember as nigrescens. And then there's Ortonia. Scabrum can do it. I'll have to switch over. Okay. You find this mushroom. This is how you use the bow leaf filter. You could try and enter red or red orange on top. You could try and enter buff yellow underneath. But look at that cap. You go in and you look, you'll be down to a limited number. This is Hortonia. Um, it's just that distinctive. Now, the other big feature that everybody around here should learn, and if you're gonna take notes, start taking notes on this. We have wonderful bow weights in our area with one problem. And that problem is things like plumbio violaceous and this critter. You see how those pores are a light pink? Now, the bully filter has an entry for pink, red. This is under red because they're pinkish. When it's a baby, it starts looking like this, all white and delicious. This is the great betrayer. This is the enemy of all Europeans who come here to our shores. This is the evil SOB known as Tylopolis felius, the bitter bully. See that little bugger there in my hand? Covers what, two knuckles? This will ruin an entire pot roast. You mix it into five pounds of hamburger meat, gone, throw it out. It's that bitter. Now when it's this age, it's really tricky. The distinction is it looks like a king bully, like a bolitus, but those have white netting. This has dark netting. If you see white netting, you jump up and down for joy. Now, when this critter, when Phileas is a true baby, and, and I mean like yay big, and there's not even any, uh, any pores, all the tubes are closed because they're so tiny, Sometimes there will be a little thing that looks like it might be white netting at the very top. Taste it. There's no toxins in any of these bullies. They're safe. Taste it. Give it a 20 second chew. Spit it out. You'll find out. If it's a bitter bully, you'll know. Believe me. Here's another one, another group. There's three of these, okay? Nobody can figure them out without a microscope. These are the horny bolitas, the little guys. That's real size clover. That's not big clover. Okay. These are, yeah, the cap will be that big on a big one. Um, 
bullied Bill swears he once saw one with a three inch cap. It was all of that big. That's a huge one. These are perfectly edible. They're tiny, red over yellow. Um, if you look at the stem, there's usually ridges going up and down that are sufficient to catch your thumbnail. Um, the tubes get deep, it'll blue. But the real tell is they're tiny. This is not a young baby mushroom here, right? Those pores are wide open. If it's tiny, yellow, wide open pores, bruise blue, it's a hoarding. You don't care if it's campestris or rubellus or I think it's leucomycelinus. You just don't care. They're all good. They're much better when they're dried. They're what Kate calls babki, grandma mushroom. The things that connoisseurs turn their nose up at and frugal grandmothers fill bushels with them, dehydrate them, and keep them for all winter long. Speaking of bobkey, this is my favorite bobkey. Uh, that's another tiny photo. Darn it. This is the slime balls. Okay, these are the swillers. In the autumn around here, we will start to see Foliage with usually with big yellow pores and that are just completely slimy on top. Those are the swillers. There's a whole family of them. Oh, let me find them up here. There's all the swillers, and here are the swillers in southwest Pennsylvania. Seven of them. Butterball, Slippery Jack, you get the idea. Um, chicken fat, Willis, this is what we were just looking at. These are everywhere under white pine. Swillers seem to like conifers for some reason. I don't really understand. Um, but all of these, look, good, 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 good. And then Castanella, which is a weird I've never found. Um, they're bad eating when they're fresh. I will be the first to say that before anybody wants to get on me. The only one of these that's good eating fresh is maybe uh, Spragii, and even that's not good. You put them in your dehydrator, dry them out to chips, and the sliminess disappears. Uh, when you rehydrate them, they're just a dried mushroom that will fill you up and is delicious. There we go. When they get old, when they're young, they have yellow pores. When they get older, the pores will get brown. They're big, giant, open pores. If you enter that feature on the bully filter, you will rapidly get to this. But the big tell is it's slimy, very viscid. Yeah. Here's one that you all know that I should talk about. Let me go back, screen share on this. People are going to be shocked that I'm about to call this easy. But it is because there's only a couple of them. And there it is. The red mouth bully. The one that Gary Linkoff in the last two years of his life was telling everybody they had to eat because it was the most delicious mushroom he knew of. They are, they're very good. They're good fresh, they're good dried. They're just really good. Now people have avoided them for years because of an old warning that drives me a little bit nuts. Don't eat bolates with red pores that bruise blue. Okay. That warning is missing the all important first part of it. The real warning goes back in tradition. It sounds like this. If you are all alone in the woods and completely pig dog ignorant about mushroom picking, but you're hungry and you need food, pick the ones that have pores instead of gills, because none of them can kill you. The very worst of them will make you sick. And you can live with being sick. You can't live with starvation. And you can't live with poison that will destroy your liver. But you know what? If you're starving in the woods, you probably don't want to get sick either. 
and all the worst bullies in the entire world, the real bad sick makers, uh, there are 12 of them in North America and seven of them, I believe, belong to the genus Rubrobolitis. And all the Rubrobolitis have red pores and stained blue. So the advice was, if you're all alone in the woods and you're pig dog ignorant about mushrooms and you're worried about starvation, pick bolides because they're safe, but you may wanna not get the red pore blue one because if you're pig dog ignorant, it's a problem. If you're watching this, I hope you're not pig dog ignorant. And clue number two, we don't have any of the bad rubrobolides in our area. This has two lookalikes, okay? There's two mushrooms it could be. Under hemlock, if it has red at the very bottom, like red fuzz, it's subvilutopy, the name that everybody uses. We now know that that's a separate species from the one that uh, of many names, which could be discolor or subluridellus or um, what my friend Igor out in New Jersey laughingly calls chameleonensis because it has so many different looks. But it's a straight, simple, plain snipe. Sometimes it'll have up and down marks like this. It's yellow or it's brown. The cap is red or brown. The pores are brilliant red. They bruise like a maniac. Find new people. Gary Linkoff charmed Cecily, our current club president, when she was brand new, by giving her this mushroom. He said, write your initials on the inside. She did, and <gasps> behold, it signed her name. And he gave it to her as a special remembrance gift and started a lifelong obsession. You can do the same. The only one that's remotely a lookalike is this next one. This isn't red, right? This is brown. And this is in yellow on the stem. This is sort of white buff gray. This is the mushroom alternately called uh, Boletus or Neobolitus, whatever the genus is. Vermiculosus or Vermiculosoides. I am not convinced there are two species. Um, I can't tell them apart. We call them the vermiculo somethings. Um, they bruise black, not blue. This is distinctive. Uh, the stem is wrong when you get used to it. They're not toxic. They're distinctly meh. Uh, the scarlatinas, these, those are good eats. This one, meh, dried out. It's bobkey, put it in food. Now, we do have one to watch out for in our area. This is not known to be toxic, but it is a rubrobolitis. And so I will tell everybody to avoid it. This is a very rare mushroom in our area. It's much more common in Ohio and Western New York. If you look, here's a better photo that John Klitschke took. Um, red netting. Red pores stained blue. Red netting is a much worse sign than red pores. We don't know if this one's toxic or not. We just know it's in the same genus as the bad boys, so we are going to avoid it. Um, now, of course, Frosty Eye has red netting, but if you can confuse that mushroom with that mushroom, you deserve some toilet time. That's all I got to say about the matter. So, Scarlatina, Scarlatina, Vermiculo something. Eh, you could confuse that one, I suppose. The one with netting. In our area, I have met this exactly once when I was just starting to get into bow leads was up at Pine Ridge Park. Lamont, if you're listening to this, that red Ford bully that we called Subville Utopies, but wasn't, this is what it was. It was, uh, it was Rhodosanguineus. Um, now this has its own tells. They call it the perfume bully because when it dries out, it smells perfumey. Apparently it smells and tastes fruity. 
I've never come across it. Like I said, um, I have had people on the internet tell me they ate it and enjoyed it. Um, I won't go near Rubro Bolitas. Uh, it's a standing joke that I won't eat any Amanitas at all either, just out of pure fear and terror. Yes, I know there are ways to make them safe. And yes, I know there's a whole branch of Amanitas that are always safe. I don't eat Amanitas. I don't eat Rubro Bolitas. Um, that's on you. And this one didn't go in order, but you can see what it is. Remember, hollow stem. It's a gyroporus. Which one? You can look it up. They are all good eats. It's going to be castaneous again. Uh, ground or castaneous by any other name, whatever that is nowadays. Let me see if I can't find that other one for you. Okay, let's head back to the bolete filter and go down the last stuff we want to do. People, I, I want to remind you, boletes are so hard, right? They're the ones that are so difficult. We just went down 20 different mushrooms that are easy. How many mushrooms do you know? I mean, if you want to be a club mycologist, if you want to be an identifier, if you want to be an identifier, 20 delicious edible mushrooms plus the, the bitters, you're in great shape. You want to be new, you want to find good edible mushrooms, you're in great shape. Learn the bitters, look for the bullies. It's that simple. Um, if you want to get down to the details, then you got to start learning the keys. What else did I want to talk about? Um, the hardest part of the bolides, and this is true for a lot of mushrooms, but bolides, I think, in particular. Learning them is a gestalt. You learn the whole thing. If JP3 is watching, I give him flack, no end, but this is meant to, as an honor. Imagine you're an alien from outer space. Okay? You're trying to decide which little girl is which. Well, you can, if you go down the key of human girl, there's yellow hair and brown hair and black hair. There's tall and short and fat and skinny and all those different things. But the teacher in the classroom <coughs> remembers all 3,000 kids she's ever taught. They don't get confused because little Janie and little Johnny little Jimmy and little Jill are four different kids and two of them are boys. She never confuses them. The alien from outer space, he gets confused because he's not built for it. The great identifiers just know these mushrooms. They know them like that teacher knows her little kids. The bullies learn the simple ones. You'll know that. And then move on. The key is most useful, Bill, you recently wrote, to go back and key out the ones you know, because then you'll start to follow it. The Bolete filter is a wonderful tool to get you close. That's what it's for. It's a synoptic key. It's not an identifier. Um, please don't use it that way because I deliberately left information out of it that is in the books, because I'm using things that uh, the doctors beset put in, and I don't want to be cutting into their territory. So buy the book and use this as the key. Now, part of a gestalt is more or less. Quartonii, remember the wrinkled cap one over there? The wrinkled compared to what? You need to know some things are smooth, some of them get cracked, one of our favorite edibles in the area, Boletus separans, has a bumpy cap. When you know what that means, you'll always recognize it. It's simple. Um, it has lilac tones. Let me look it up. Lilac tones on the site. 
what the devil does tones mean? And lilac is not easy. So there, that's a classic separate on the screen. Yeah, yeah, white netting. Here we go. See, the cap isn't smooth, it's bumpy. But you have to have sort of a general basis for what it means. Let's see if we can find lilac tones. Here we go. This is why it's not lilac. But right here, when you got the little bumpy cap, and it's sort of got white netting, and you look down, and it's pinkish. There's your lock. Now, separance is actually a pain to identify because the pores go from white uh, all the way up to yellow as it gets older. The cap is always, you know, it's not an even. But once you know those tells, you've got it. Um, I'm getting near the end. So let me go down. What other notes do I want to share? The blue bluesing myth. What makes bowleeds turn blue? Um, it's the same thing that makes other ones turn red. There's a wonderful article that look up um, blue bruising bullets and you will see it. Here, Bowerangia bicolor. This is a species spectrum. No, don't ever ask anybody about this. There's half a dozen bicolor, things that we call bicolor. And then there's another half dozen that looks sort of kind of like this, <coughs> but have enough distinctions that we can call them something different. You see the red on bicolor? That comes from some organic acids that are naturally occurring, non-toxic, delicious, no problems with it. Those acids, when you leave them exposed to oxygen, will slowly turn red. That leads to the red color in all the bullets. There's a lot of different acids, but that's what they do. The blue, let me go find another one here. Blue bruising happens because certain bullets also contain enzymes that, I don't know if the right word is buffer, but they alter the reaction. Let's see here, how about, Cyano blue. Oh, that's a fun one. You want blue bruising. Cyano bolitis. Blues if you breathe on it. Here, this will make the point. Carminopes grows up in our area, up in New York. It's mostly a northeastern mushroom. But this will show you. It turns blue instantly, fades to brown later. The red comes from those organic acids. They oxidize slowly over time. The blue is because when you cut it, you broke the cell walls. You released those enzymes. And the enzymes change that reaction so it doesn't turn red, it turns blue instead. Bluing has nothing to do with edibility. Nothing whatsoever. Uh, it only gets mentioned because people were scared of the rubrobolitis group of California in particular. The rubrobolitis have red pores, rubies blue, they're bad boys. And in case you're really gonna be worried about them, that's ours, Rub rubros singularis. Dupanii has been found twice on the continent. This is the worst bully in the entire continent grows only in the West Coast. We don't see it. And it's big, beefy monster of a thing. If you're on the West Coast or visiting, don't pick red for blue stainers until you know what's going on. You could get sick. I think that will about cover it. The only other thing are all the normal things. Know the trees that are associated. Um, Bolides don't get farmed because they only grow with mature trees. Around here, everything is oak when we have rain. Uh, so you look for the ones that grow with oak. In the fall, the, uh, the swillis, the slime balls, they all grow with white pine usually. 
maybe with screws. Um, but it's pretty much there. Richard, I'm going to call this done. I think I'm pretty much there. I hope everybody has enjoyed this. Um, remember, bullies like to laugh at you. If the conditions change, if it gets dry, if it gets old, the colors will shift. Color is not that reliable, but you get used to it. Learn the ones. Learn the 10 I just showed. They're all easy when you know the tells. Learn the other 10 that come in categories, the scarlatinas, the wrinkly cat ones, the slime balls. They're all easy. Little tiny horty bolitas. They're all easy. They're all edible. They're all good if you dry them out with the, the swillers. And you will have 20, 30 mushrooms, bing, bang, boom, out of those terribly hard bullies. Bye, everybody. Hope you enjoyed it. Have a great time, and please pray for rain. All right. Well, thank you, Scott. And um, we will be having our, our club Zoom meeting that an invite was sent out afterwards uh, for after this event. So um, I'll be jumping over to there in a second and starting that up. And um, this talk will be available on our YouTube channel. So thanks for tuning in and apologies for the very rough start. Okay, we will end it there. Bye all, thank you, Scott. So how do I find this Zoom meeting, Richard? Sorry. <laughs>